Ladies and gentlemen, have any of you watched National Geographic or perhaps a documentary about penguins or animals in the savannah? You really get a glimpse of uh, their day-to-day -day life, uh, their mindset, and things that they do to survive in the wild. Well, the How to Lose at Chess playlist here on my YouTube channel is kind of like that, but with lower rated players playing games of chess. And today we are going to look at a game. Uh, that was recently in a Guess the Elo episode that I'm not sure has been released yet, actually. This video is getting released uh, earlier than that episode. An incredible game. A pretty high-level and fascinating battle between two 1100-rated players. Um, our protagonists are Biscuit, who is a longtime subscriber of the channel. Uh, they both get honorary Grandmaster titles. Uh, and Joao, and I don't know exactly how to know how to say that uh, for my uh, Portuguese-speaking audience uh, from Brazil. Um, but, uh, you know, he gets a GM title as well. Nice, uh, you know, cute picture here, nice purple hat. This guy is a cartoon dragon, so there we go. Um, this game had everything, blunders, absurd moves, and a brilliancy. So uh, we're gonna enjoy it and watch how these animals survive in the wild. Biscuit begins the game with E4 and C5. We're already off to a good start. I very famously said in a video that if you're below 2,000, you should not play the Sicilian defense. The Sicilian defense is a very interesting opening. It does, in fact, try to fight for the center with a flank pawn, right? Because flank pawns are C and F. These are the center pawns. And it leads to all sorts of crazy stuff. White has the option to play knight F3, D4, the open Sicilian, or anything else. The Alapin, the smith Mora Gambit, the wing Gambit, close Sicilian. White plays F4, so Biscuit plays another pawn into the middle and is worse on move two. The reason uh, the computer doesn't like this is because it thinks that black can very quickly play for D5, so E6 and then D5 and just, you know, attack the middle and this is completely fine for black. Uh, but black plays the move G6, so black is obviously uh, playing for an accelerated uh, dragon. This is a dragon Sicilian when the bishop is going to G7, fighting against the middle with the bishop as well as the knight. So very fluid structure. I mean, as, if you're going to play the Sicilian as a low-rated player, uh, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, you should, you should go for the dragon, in my opinion. White plays knight C3, so kind of playing in a close Sicilian fashion, Vienna style. Uh, and obviously, black finishes the development of the bishop with the move E6. Um, by putting two pawns now on light squares and giving the bishop two doors to depart on, which, of course, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and uh, yeah, on move three, we already have the first confusing moment. Now, the reason this doesn't make any sense is because you have eight pawns and you are now committing six of them to the light squares, which obviously means that your light squares are very uh, strong, but it means that your bishop is, like, you get what I'm saying? Like, if this bishop is gone, your position's like Swiss cheese. Okay, so knight f3. I mean, white is playing very well so far. Now black obviously finishes developing the dark squared bishop uh, to g7 or justifies the move e6 with his follow-up d5. No, black plays knight f6. Okay, uh, in general, the rule of thumb is if your knight is in the middle of the board like this and can get kicked out with a pawn that will force you to an uncomfortable position, that should be played. White should unquestionably play e5 here, locking in on the dark squares, right? Fighting against this dark squared weak complex. Uh, but white doesn't do that and instead plays d4. Now, I'm going to say this very loudly for anybody who's listening. If you commit the e and f pawns forward in a Sicilian defense, like if you don't just play e4, c5, followed by knight f3 and d4, like if you do all this stuff, don't play d4 anymore. Because the truth is, it's bad to open up the center and open up the flank for the king. You're just, your position's very open. And if the opponent is smart, they're gonna smash into your center, they're gonna play bishop b4, they're gonna play d5, etc. But now black decides to go back to the other strategy of finishing their development and is completely lost. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously black should have played bishop g7 after the move g6. I mean, there is no other reason to play the move g6. I actually cannot begin to explain to you the logic here whatsoever. But black plays bishop g7. Now black is completely lost because white will play the move e5. Look at that! Now the knight's got very uncomfortable decision. Go to d5, get taken, doubled pawns, horrible weakness, right? Quick, quickly uh, picking that up. Also, look at this juicy square on d6. <clears throat> Excuse me. Knight b5, knight d6 is gonna, is gonna drive in, right? So the knight goes to h5. Uh, white here has to be careful of one thing. Uh, it's not this pawn. It's not that, because this is protected, right? You would think that white can play bishop e2, or even better, white can play the move g4, but uh, it turns out that black was a genius this entire time. The move e6 had a point, which black didn't even know existed. Black got very lucky here. Uh, but it actually turns out that white's position is a little bit delicate. There is one weakness in the white position. White completely misses it and plays the move g4. Now it looks all fine and good. It looks like white is trapping the knight. White is a genius. The black knight has no moves. And it's true, it, it does have no moves. But you know who does have a move? And this is why you always look for checks for yourself and for your opponent. 
Queen H4. And all of a sudden, white is losing. Low-level chess, you gotta love it. Uh, yeah, Queen H4 is a brutal cold shower for white, who now either plays King E2, allowing Queen takes G4 check, or Knight to G3, HG, and Queen takes H1. Uh, or white plays King D2 as in the game, uh, and now the knight can take on F4. So the knight is free, the bishop is blocked, the entire center collapses, and now uh, you are losing. What white had to do before playing G4 was to see Queen H4 and actually just back up. And the move G4 now is basically unstoppable. Uh, black could play bishop f8, g4, knight g7, but that, that, I mean, that's just, that just looks stupid beyond belief. So, g4, queen h4, king d2, and as always in these games, there are many plot twists, and now, uh, black is winning. White here plays the move queen f3, attacking the knight. But this is actually not an attack on the knight whatsoever. Uh, for example, let's say black were to castle here, uh, and white plays the move queen takes knight. Uh, the queen and the king are on the same diagonal, bishop h6. This is how you actually set traps in chess. Um, and the, the bishop is, of course, protected by the queen. You can always just, you know, castle out of the way and say, oh no, my, my knight, and somewhere Eric Rosen tingles a little bit. Uh, queen f4, bishop h6 would be winning material. But black, you know, black can also take a pawn for absolutely free and then defend the knight. But instead, black plays queen g5. Uh, and almost all the advantage disappears here because white has an awesome move. Uh, white has a move here, king d1. Look at this move. Amazing move. This is why these games are very, you know, 1100 is, is a place where there's terrible moves, but there's good moves as well. King d1, beautiful move. And now black realizes that they have bishop takes e5. So black is two pawns up. But how is black not completely winning? Why is white winning? Black is two pawns up. Why is white winning? Well, white is winning because these pieces are tied to the knight. And black's king is still in the middle. So here, there is this incredible h4. And white finds it. And the point is that if you play queen h6 to try to stay, you know, over here, I can drive this knight, which is under attack, back to e2. PP on the PP. Now, parents, I'm not making an inappropriate comment here. Uh, that means put pressure on the pinned piece. This is a pinned piece. You are putting pressure on it. This is, this is overwhelmed now. Now that's it. I mean, white is just going to win material. So PP on the PP. All right, kids are gonna laugh, to, uh, la love that. I mean, so are 20, 30 year olds. Don't act like you have any sort of maturity whatsoever. Every time you see 69 anywhere, you write nice. All right, all right, forget about it. Queen e7. Now, the move here is bishop takes knight. However, black has bishop takes knight himself. But actually, this is the best way to continue because in this position, there is an amazing knight b5. White is threatening the bishop, white is also threatening this, and if you play bishop back to d6, there, a b6, there is this. And this is why you just, you, you cannot put so many pawns on light squares, all right? Six of your seven pawns cannot possibly be on the light squares. That just doesn't make any sense. Because you have huge dark squared weaknesses, uh, and, and, and this is really, really bad. White, though, doesn't see that. White plays knight back to b3. Uh, and the evaluation plummets off a cliff because now black has queen d6 check, which they find, defending the knight once again, and white plays king e1. Now, uh, folks, if the king moves in a triangle, uh, there are no castling rights restored. Like, if you go back to the home base, you cannot castle, right? So black plays knight c6. We have bishop takes knight, bishop takes knight, and the game is minus four for black, okay? Uh, how do you play a position like this where you are completely lost? Like, what do you do, right? and you can't castle and you're in disarray, you have to be aggressive. So you have to create counterplay against your opponent's most prized possessions. You obviously have to look out for checks against you, but as long as you can defend them, you'll be completely fine. Which is why I like the move knight b5. It's a great move. Um, computer might not like it, but I love it. Queen b4 check. And immediately, black panics, right? Because people, people are very like, they, they, they have an itch, they're gonna scratch it. They see a check. Um, and in general, what you should do when you are checked is try to realize as long as everything is protected, you have to continue to create threats. Now black struggles to defend their bishop. For example, if they go here, you have knight c5, they have to relinquish all defense of the bishop. The bishop is completely lost. You win the bishop, you win the game. So queen b4 is just asking for trouble because you can't return back to the home square. But okay, white misses it. White plays knight back to c3. Uh, and now... Black has no more threats, right? Everything is protected. What should black do? What is the major thing missing in the black position from a peaceful position? Castling. Get the king to safety, bring in the rest of the forces, win the game. Okay? If your opponent tries to open up lines of attack to you, keep them closed. Close, the, close everything. Close, just shut it down. 
Don't allow the opponent to infiltrate, okay? There's a lot to learn here. But black is antsy and continues moving forward and forgetting about the back line, right? So white takes on d4, queen d4, and is able to bring another piece to the party. Now, here, as far as I'm concerned as a chess coach, there is one move for black and only one move. If you count the material, black is two pawns up, but black has horrible development. So here, there is no reason to hunt the white position further. I would trade queens. Trade the queens. Whether your opponent takes you or not, the next move, like knight b5 threatens a fork, but you can castle away, okay? Like you can get out of there. You can also bring the bishop back and try to protect, right? You can bring the bishop back this way and cover everything. Um, the reason you do this is because without my queen, I, I cannot deliver a fatal blow, okay? I can just not do it. But you play queen e5 check, and now what white should do is play, well, defensively, you know, down to e2. You should never block a check or any valuable piece in a way that you can be bulldozed. And in this position, blocking the check with the knight sets up either d5 or f5. Uh, both moves. I mean, just very clean. Oh, the knight's blocking the king? Okay, easy peasy. I mean, just attack the knight. That's it. You, you win another piece. You add it to your collection. Wonderful. Black's advantage is now minus eight. Black, however, once again makes a, a horrible mistake. I mean, they're just using what's out there. Why did the chess gods bestow upon black two rooks, a bishop, a king, and a partridge in a pear tree. I just don't understand. And, and five pawns. Black has five pawns. They're not using nine of the 16 pieces that the good chess gods have bestowed upon them. I mean, I just don't understand. Black plays bishop g3 check, which by... Watch what happens here, okay? All hell breaks loose. You cannot take like this, so white plays queen takes. Now, you'll notice the eval is getting close to equal, but you'll also notice this is a fork of king and rook. So what the heck is the computer talking about? I don't understand at all, right? I mean, what is the computer talking about? This is why it's minus one. If there are four positions and one of them is minus one, but the rest are minus nine, is it minus one or minus nine? This and only this reason is why the position is minus one. King d2. What? Because after queen takes rook, Bishop g2 traps the queen. That's why. White has to realize they are losing the rook, and then they can trap the queen. So naturally, white plays king f2, thinking that queen h1, bishop g2 is a trapped queen, but they forget that the rook is hanging. The, that's why the king needs to go the other way. It's completely counterintuitive, right? Completely counterintuitive. The king has to go to d2. But the king goes to f2. The king goes to f2, and now black has queen h1, and goes the complete opposite direction. Yeah, I mean, I understand. It was a little bit hard to see. You know, one way you lose the, you lose the rook, one, two, two squares, and one day, you know, three squares. It's easier to see two squares than three squares, right? Okay, you see the pawn, right? And black also has some sort of fetish in this game for giving checks. Uh, I, don't, I don't exactly know why. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, queen takes c2 check. Now white plays bishop 2e2. Now... Folks, what is the one thing missing from the black position? I've been saying this a million times. Like, if black were to castle here, I'm sure the advantage would go away a little bit because white can get an attack. Just castle, for the love of God. I mean, just castle, right? And still, you see how many dark squared weaknesses you have. I'm already fantasizing, you know, queen e5, h5, h6, deliver mate on g7, right? That's the stuff you have to think about. But black just took on c2, so what do you think black is going to do here? Queen b2. Black goes full-on hungry, hungry hippo and takes every pawn. So instant replay, instead of taking a rook, we go wah -oh, wah -oh, wah -oh, wah -oh, wah -oh. So we just queen c2, queen b2, queen a2, we've taken every pawn. And the position is zero, zero, zero. What? Black is up five pawns and it's zero, what? Why? Because here white can play queen c3, attacking the rook and there's no easy way for black to defend himself. There's no easy way, apparently. If black plays rook f8, there is the absolutely ludicrous. There is one move in this position, top engine move, only move. This move is so savage. It's one of the most savage moves I've ever seen in my life. Rook d4, the threat, the queen is trapped. The black queen has nowhere to move. The black queen has nowhere to move. The black queen has nowhere to move. I told you, the black queen has nowhere to go. Rook a1 is threatened. You are threatening rook a1 to trap the queen. And what's worse, you are also threatening the bishop, which never moved and therefore has no defenders. You're threatening rook a1 and rook c8. This is a perfect example of why you need to get all the pieces involved for, for... I don't even know what I'm trying to say. I was going to say, for God's sake, I almost said, damn it. I fused like four expressions there. Do you think that white found this? 
Of course not. But I really like White's move h5. When you are dead lost, you need to create counterplay and you have to infiltrate against the pawn wall with your pawns, right? White doesn't find queen c3, but white does find queen e5. Now, admittedly, it is minus three. And here, black can castle and avoid getting mated with the move f6, the final move that you have to find. And queen d6, queen e7 looks terrifying, but it's not. There's queen b2, queen e7, and you open the door f5. That is very hard to see. Very hard to see. Combining long diagonal with queen of... No way. Un un unfindable. Black plays rook g8, and now white is on the warpath. Cracks open the h-file. Brings in the rook. Oh my goodness, white is completely winning. No way. White has made a full comeback, and the king and the rook and the bishop and the rook have all been left in the middle of the board. Obviously, black is going to pay for his sins. I mean, what is black doing? What the heck? Apparently, black here had to take with the h-pawn, and allow rook h8. So the pawns needed to stay near the king. But because black took with the f pawn, now the walk to the king is right here. That's what white has to do. Black plays rook f8 check. Now, white has the choice of king moves. One, two, three, four, five. Where's white going to move? Two of these moves win the game. If you play king back to g1, you win the game. If you play king to g3, you win the game. King to g2, you do not win the game. You have to go to g3 or g1. You are watching how to lose at chess. Animals playing chess, basically, right? White plays king to e1. All the advantage is gone. Now, uh, these moves are really difficult to understand. Uh, the point is that, for example, if you're checked here, the engine wants the king to run out to h4. If anybody does that against you, report them for cheating. Nobody plays chess like this, not even myself. Um, king to g1. The point is that, again, if the, if the queen wants to harass the king, there's no moves. The, the king is completely covered. Like, every check is covered by your queen. So, white plays king e1, black plays queen c2, and is losing the game once again, but only if white plays rook to h8. Apparently, that is the only winning move. White instead plays the human move, which is queen g7, threatening a mate on e7. Now, there is only one move here for black to stop that. Black finds it. Queen c5, clutch. Preventing mate, everything looks quite decent. Now, white plays bishop d3, naturally attacking the pawn on g6 and looking to bulldoze. Bishop d3 is an amazing move. Yeah, you know, getting one more piece into the game, except it hangs mate in one and loses on the spot. And you would think that the guy who only played the game with basically one piece, who just moved the queen to protect mate, would by accident get lucky. This is also the only mo way to lose, because before this, your king could move here with the bishop here. But now your king is completely boxed in. Queen f2 wins the game on the spot, defended by the only other piece that black has. Black has just moved queen c5. You would think that this would happen. Queen c5. And here, you will not believe the next move. Black played queen e3. How the hell did black play the move one square away from mate? I mean, are, what are we doing here? Like, you could have won this game by mistake. By mistake, you could have played queen f2. Oh, mouse, oh, it's mate. You ever do that? You ever like play a move and you're like, oh, it's mate, wow. I thought it was just check. Black plays here. Bishop e2. And now this, now this, Can you, what? Now, one move here for, for, for black. You have to go all the way back. You have to trade the queen. With no queens on the board again, black is winning. Easily. Black. Almost makes it there, but is obsessed with checking white. White beelines it for the queen side. All right, queen a4 check. King to b2. Queen b4 check. And now white very intelligently plays king c1. And all of a sudden, there's no more checks, right? No, of course there's checks. Queen a3, queen c5. Just keep checking. As long as you keep checking, you will never lose the game. Because there is, right? Just keep checking, you know? But black plays b6. Black plays b6. Looking to play bishop b7 and get mated in one move. At some point, maybe rook c8. And in this position, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience of 19 moves. White uncorks a brilliancy. White realizes that bishop d3 is not going to get him anywhere, right? Queen takes g6 as a check, but that allows the king to escape to c7. So white realizes that they can play rook takes d7. Brilliancy. Now, black is dead lost, except for one move. 
everything else is losing. You are threatening a mate on e7. If bishop takes its mate, what do you do? Black has one chance, one opportunity. They have to play queen a3 check. And the variation goes check, here, check, here, check. The king cannot go to the f-file. Rook d3, queen c1, rook d2, queen c5, king e4, queen c6. You can't go here, but you could, you, you could try. So black has to find this sequence of moves. Black plays queen c5 check. White plays king to d1. And the game is over, as there are no more checks. Black can play queen g1 check. That is the final one remaining, after which white will play king d2. And the game is over. Black plays rook f1, bishop takes f1, and in the face of an imminent disaster for this king getting mated in like 47 different ways, Black resigns. What a game. And what a brilliant final problem White set for Black, throwing in another rook. If Black had followed the advice that, I, that, that White played as, getting all the pieces involved, admittedly, White, I mean, it wouldn't have been a low elo game without just a recreational made in one blunder. But if Black had actually followed the advice, then they would have actually been successful in this game. But when you do not play with more than half of your pieces until move 25 or 30, when you do not develop your bishop or your rook and you never touch your king, you deserve to lose. And Black did.